And good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us once again for the Fifth Avenue Synagogue Sunday Speaker Series. Tonight, we have, a priv have the privilege to hear from a member of one of the most well-known and influential families within uh, New York City life. Uh, James Tish, Jimmy Tish, is the president and CEO of Lowe's Corporation. And as a boy who was raised in uh, Brooklyn, I can attest that more or less uh, all of us are, were familiar with the uh, Tish name uh, growing up. Even though we never met you, it's uh, definitely a name we all uh, were aware of, whether it's because of you saw it on a hospital building or another institution throughout the city. It most definitely is a name recognized, a family name recognized for its philanthropy and concern for the welfare of New York City life. Our speaker tonight also has a personal connection to the synagogue. Uh, I believe some of his grandchildren, specifically I know Teddy, was enrolled in the Creative Play School upstairs at the synagogue. And our son uh, Moshe, they used to have uh, play dates together in, uh, in our houses, uh, Moshe and Teddy a few years back, and they, they were quite good friends. I'd like to call upon Fifth Avenue Synagogue Honorary President Ezra Merkin uh, to formally introduce uh, Mr. Tish. And needless to say, Ezra and Lauren have done so much for our synagogue, our shul, on a variety of levels. They are intimately involved in the shul renovation project and have greatly assisted on the Sunday night program as well as many other areas. And once again, Ezra, we always thank you for your commitment, your effort, your concern for the needs of our members and our community. Please God, only happy occasions to you, Lauren, and the entire family. Amen. Uh, following uh, Ezra's formal introduction, the program will be moderate, moderated by Ezra and President Jacob Gold. Thank you, Rabbi Babbage. And thank you uh, very much to Jimmy. Jimmy already lost an hour today uh, because he changed his clock and he's uh, was very good natured about uh, facing the possibility of losing another hour to us uh, this evening. So we are very grateful for him. We could fill the hour by uh, reading out loud his resume. Uh, it's gone out to everyone. I just thought I would introduce Jimmy by way of a story that he may or may not remember. It goes back about 25 years. Uh, I was sitting in my office comfortably minding my own business one day when Jimmy and the late Arthur Zankel settled into two visitor chairs across from my desk, uh, Jimmy informed me that he was going to take over as the lay head of UGA Federation. My guess this is roughly 1996. And uh, Arthur informed me that I was gonna take over as head of the investment committee for UGA Federation. Um, there really was not a whole lot of protesting and it really was sort of, you know, informing me. And so, uh, and Jimmy said, you know, I'm gonna be the lay head for three years and I sort of want you to keep an eye on the committee, um, but you don't have to do it for more than three years. Um, Jimmy was the best boss ever in the sense that uh, I never saw him in an investment committee ever again. Uh, he came to the first one that I was chairman of, he stayed for 10 minutes. And again, when I say Jimmy came, um, if you are on time for a meeting with Jimmy, you are late. Jimmy is always there early in all well, the innumerable breakfasts, lunch, dinners, walks, visits in the office. I have never beaten Jimmy to uh, the assigned place, uh, even when I was coming a couple of minutes early. So it was, you know, a lot of fun to work with him then. Um, the UJ Federation actually was nice enough. I enjoyed it a lot. I ended up staying through a total of about 12 years. I think I did four three-year terms. The last one was cut short. I ended up doing, I then ended up uh, either late 2008 or early 2009 when the, uh, when the Madoff bomb went off, but um, it started with Jimmy and, and uh, it was one of the things I actually was uh, very proud of. I think the committee did a very good job for Federation. Um, when you have, you know, when you have Jimmy as a friend, you have Jimmy as a friend. One of the things that I always remember going back to that time, like 2008, early 2009, when, as I said, the Madoff bomb went off, sure enough, the phone rings, Jimmy's on the phone. He says, look, you got to be sure that you get out, you don't stay home, you don't roll yourself up to a big ball and stay under the covers. Meryl and I are taking you and Lauren out to dinner. Now, we had been out to dinner with them innumerable number of times before and innumerable number of times since. But in that period of time, he kind of kicked up the frequency without really letting me know. And uh, it's just one of the reasons that I say if you have Jimmy as a friend, uh, you, you have a friend. Um, I thought I would start, Jimmy, by talking about basically New York, where we are, COVID, 
um, the very challenging times that we are going through, um, you've got perspectives that I think are really pretty unusual in the sense that you see these things both as an employer uh, at Lowe's um, and as uh, the, I guess, co-chair of the board at Mount Sinai Health Systems. Um, we're going to have a change uh, in the mayorality come November. There may be a change in the governor's mansion before a year from that, uh, just depending on what happens, you know, that's sort of almost an hourly change. So I'm just curious, you know, where do you think we are with COVID? What do you think the next steps are? Um, and then get a sense of, you know, at what pace, when and how do you think people return to the city? Um, and then just curious, getting a little bit of a sense if it's not out of school, what really happened at Mount Sinai in the spring, you know, COVID panic and what Mount Sinai is doing about COVID these days. So first of all, thank you very much for having me here. As, uh, as the Beatles would have sung, it's wonderful to be here. It's certainly a thrill. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully you'll be such a lovely audience that I want right. to take you home with me. I want to take you home with me. Right. Um, we'll do our best. But I, 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 I've said many times that Ezra's memory is much better than mine. I can only answer one question at a time. And I think I counted three, four, or five in there. So I'm going to start with New York City, and then we can go where, wherever you want. OK. So I fear for the future of New York City. Uh, and I fear for the future because, uh, number one, the pandemic has changed just about everything. We're going to get through the pandemic, um, I think, sooner than people think. But I think the pandemic is going to have a lasting effect on New York City. And the reason is because I think, among other things, the new normal will be that people don't have to go to their offices every day of the week. Instead, uh, they'll be able to go, they'll be able to work from home one or two, at least one or two days a week. And the reason uh, I think they'll be able to do that is because they've become accustomed to it. Because for most people, the commute is at least an hour each way. And they like not not having to commute every, every day. And so I, I think that um, that's gonna be something that's, that's uh, put in place. Uh, and that will have an enormous effect on the real estate market. And it will also have an enormous effect on the city uh, on the MTA, which won't get the revenues that it previously had. So it's going to have repercussions in many, many ways. Combined with that, people have seen that they don't need to be in New York City to do their jobs uh, during the pandemic. Um, so New York City, which up till now for many people is a place where they had to be, is no longer that. Between Zoom, Teams, WebEx, uh, you, can, you can be there in 10 seconds and look eye to eye with the person that you're talking to. So uh, going forward, location just isn't the same. Uh, and then additionally, um, there are budget issues for New York that uh, we're just starting to get into now, New York City and New York State. And uh, the left is firmly in control, both in the city and the state. And their goal is to raise taxes on the wealthy, not, not because they need the money, but rather uh, because they can. They view it, I think, as a, a, a sense of social justice. And I fear that a lot of the wealthy people in New York or a significant number will decamp from New York uh, in the coming years in favor of places like Florida. Uh, if you, 
they're, they're now talking about raising the top rate in income taxes by uh, three percentage points. That will mean, if they do that, that in Florida, you will be able to keep 36% more of your income than if you live in New York. And that gets to be a very large amount. Uh, but my guess is they're going to plan to do more and more. There were uh, uh, attempts to put in a wealth tax. There's uh, attempts to put in taxes on unrealized capital gains. So for wealthy people and also for employers, uh, New York, there will be more reasons to leave New York. And for people uh, who, who leave, they find in fact that it, it's easier to leave now because of all these uh, gains in technology. So I'm hopeful that we're going to get enlightened leadership uh, that tries to deal with all these issues um, uh, in a serious uh, manner, but I'm afraid that the left is the left meaning people left of liberal, the socialists. Um, I'm afraid that they're in pretty good control because it's not that every Democrat is a socialist, but the socialists are threatening to primary every Democrat who they think doesn't vote the way uh, that, that they think they should vote. So it's a very, it's a very complicated picture. And uh, right now, nobody knows how all of this is going to turn out. Are there implications to what you have just described that impact decisions you're making either for the family or for the company, or for that matter, to take something that's fascinating about Sinai Hospital? That is, there are budgetary impacts. Let's take the hospital for a moment. Um, I, I'd asked you in a cluster of questions whether you can give us a little bit of sense of how dramatically COVID transformed the hospital last spring. But looking forward, um, with so much of the future just difficult to outline very clearly, and with the notion that there might be a new normal that might be uh, two or three years in the forming and might then give away to something else again, as you plan for the future, uh, sticking with the hospital, are the, the issues that you've raised, do these have specific implications to budgeting, to focus, to areas of hospital service that you are emphasizing? Or de-emphasizing? I, yeah, I, I don't think that's going to be a serious issue for uh, Mount Sinai Medical Center. Okay. Um, I, I don't I don't think that all of a sudden, uh, in the course of a year, a million people are going to get up and move out of uh, the New York metropolitan yeah, yeah. area, which is um, Mount Sinai's service area. Um, and I don't think that uh, in the course of a year. Uh, or two, its budget is going to be cut dramatically. So I, I don't see, I don't see uh, Mount Sinai as, as uh, an institution that's, that will be affected dramatically by what I was talking about. Okay. If you, if you then turn to Lowe's, does that get affected just in terms of where Lowe's wants to have people working or just challenges to Lowe's in terms of where they're located? So it's interesting. Coincidentally, uh, about in April of last year, we were supposed to sign a lease for new space. And uh, the pandemic started and I scratched my head and I said, you know what? I don't know what the future is going to look like. Mm -hmm. Maybe we ought to just buy ourselves an additional two years where we currently are, see, see what the new normal becomes, and then we can um, move our offices. And uh, in fact, that's what we've done. And uh, I'm, really, <laughs> I'm really glad 
we did it. We're sitting back, we're taking a careful look, we're trying to understand what the new normal will be. Uh, and in the coming year, we'll, we'll make some decisions about just how much space we'll need and uh, where we'll need it. Are you tempted to go for another two-year extension, or do you think you're going to make a decision about something more reasonably permanent in, say, the next six months? You know, um, I wouldn't be surprised if we try to buy ourselves another two, two years. Um, mm -hmm. wait, wait and see how the, the picture of New York turns out. It's... Uh, there is, there um, is. first of all, across the country, there's enormous change. And I, I think uh, the pandemic is one part of that, but there's also the social change that's taking place as things like the woke culture and the cancel culture start to take hold. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I, th I think um, that's causing a lot of unease. You throw on top of that the pandemic uh, and it's more unease. And uh, I would just like things to settle down, not to be changing at such a, a rapid rate. Uh, and I'd like to be able to assess just where, where New York is moving and where the country is moving in order to be able to make some decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's, that's what's his name said. It's tough enough to predict the past. You know, when you start predicting the future, it gets really difficult. That's tough, yes. When you look at some of these issues on behalf of all these things you've done so much work for, uh, for example, say currently the New York Public Library or in your years is heading the board of Channel 13, as these institutions look at, at the challenges that you briefly describe, are they sort of on the Mount Sinai end, meaning the, these changes are much less likely to affect them, or do you think there is a, a larger impact on them than there might be uh, perhaps from Mount Sinai? My guess is they're, they're uh, in this similar school to Mount Sinai. Um, both of them uh, rely on uh, number one, government money, and then private philanthropy. New York is an extraordinarily philanthropic uh, place. And I don't, I don't see that philanthropy drying up. So despite the 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 at least um, enticement of, say, Florida for um, the donors of that philanthropy. So those are the people who are most affected by what you have described. And yeah. at some point they may take their philanthropy and go someplace else. I, I, I think um, what I've what I've seen happening with people moving to Florida is that before the pandemic, it was a drip drip mm -hmm. uh, and now it's it's more of a ripple i think a lot of people are considering it but i don't think anybody's pulling the trigger so quickly um i think that in the future it could become um a, a river of people leaving but i don't i don't foresee that uh this year or next year and you know, um, there's, the, there's the old saying, he who lives by the crystal ball must learn to eat ground glass. My, <laughs> my, my crystal ball doesn't go out farther than a year or two. Right, well, that is consistent, I think, with number one, buying time, and number two, I really think this thing is a transition. It doesn't, the new normal doesn't dawn, say, next September, next December, next January. It's, it's, um, it's, it's not a compromise, it's an equilibrium. And equilibria take time to establish themselves and have lots of things that we don't see at a time. And that process is fascinating, but it's the people who have to make decisions today about the end of that process that are really, you know, that have, that have the real difficult challenge because the unknown unknowns here are just, they're treacherous and the consequences are, are huge. And so everybody's trying to grope 
and try to, I guess, grow up is a word you shouldn't use these days, but everybody's trying to grow up and, and sort of figure out the future. It's not that hard. It's not that easy to do. Um, I think Jacob wanted to ask you one or two questions in this context as well. Yankel, you there? Yes. So, so, so Jimmy, uh, I'm sorry to hear your, your perspective on New York, but happy to, um, you know, appreciate you being open. So your family has been active, um, you know, is, is there advice you can give for the people on the webinar who are disappointed, you know, where New York might be headed? Is there any, any direction or is it sort of just wait and see? I think it's, I think it's wait and see. We have to see, um, we have to see, first of all, what happens up in Albany uh, over the short term. Uh, we have to see what happens in our mayoral race. Um, there's, there's so much at stake now uh, with the political leadership. For example, um, take, take a simple issue of the New York City public schools. Um, they're gonna start, there's a push to do away with the gifted and talented program brought mm -hmm. about by the inability to give a test this year for it. But next year, depending upon uh, who's the mayor, uh, that may go away, those tests may go away completely. Um, if that may drive out the middle class, there's from, from the city is if there's a perception that uh, they can't get a good education for their children. Uh, there are so many issues like that, that make it difficult to really uh, figure out what the future is going to be. The political leadership is really, really important. And we've got to wait and see how New Yorkers vote. Okay. Any other I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. I don't mean to give everybody an anxiety attack on, <laughs> on a, 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 a Sunday evening, but um, I, look, I, I, I think the whole country in some way is going through this too. And uh, it's, it's the uncertainty that uh, everyone is feeling. Sure. And, and on a specific question, you know, the Regency Hotel is uh, one of the most famous hotels in New York. It's located near our synagogue. And I notice every day I walk by, it's closed. Do, do you have, are you waiting and seeing when you're going to reopen the ho hotel or? So it's, it's, there's, there's no demand for hotel rooms now, driven by the fact that uh, for people coming to New York City, they had to, um, a quarantine for two weeks or 10 days or whatever. That's starting to loosen up. Uh, the, uh, the other thing is that uh, business is, the business world is starting to emerge. More, more people are getting vaccinated. Uh, and so I could see that the hotel could open up in a month or two. Oh, great. Uh, uh, Right now, right now, there's basically uh, no no business at all. But if you look at the um, um, the travel numbers, as as denoted by the number of people daily that are going through the TSA screening sites, uh, you see that there is a steady increase in travel that's happening, and um, you know, it, this is going to sound funny to everybody after what I've said for the past 15 or 20 minutes, but I'm really an optimist. And, <laughs> and um, I, for example, I believe that by the end of April of this year, every American who wants a vaccine will be able to have already had at least their first shot. So never mind what what the president is saying that by May first they'll be able to they'll be eligible to get a shot. I think they're all going to have a shot. Um, so I and I think the economy is going to be extraordinarily strong uh, 
over the coming uh, two years at, uh, in the rebound from the pandemic. Remember, after the pandemic of um, 1918, there was the roaring 20s. There was all that pent up demand. And right now there's enormous pent up demand from, from uh, the pandemic. I feel that it's going to be a bit like um, the scene from The Wizard of Oz where Dorothy's house has just landed in Oz and the, uh, the Good Witch of the North comes in and, and uh, tells all the munchkins it's safe to come out. <laughs> and and uh, I think that by May and June, people are gonna say it's safe to come out. And uh, there's the, uh, uh, the American public has saved an extraordinary amount of money during the pandemic. The statistics are crazy it's off the charts. Chart. Yeah. It's like uh, there's a, like a 15% savings rate, uh, which is unheard of. So people have money to spend even without the $1,400 that they're going to get uh, from the federal government. And they're gonna spend it, they're gonna to wanna to travel, they're gonna to want to eat out. Uh, and I, But I think that will take time for people just to get accustomed to the new normal because they've been living in their homes and their apartments without going out. And uh, at first it's gonna feel a little funny, but then I think they're, they're gonna get accustomed to life as it used to be. And I think that will be good for economic activity and for uh, the domestic travel business. Okay, great. So, so you think, Jimmy, that that uh, we're on the verge of turning COVID from a supply side problem to a demand side problem. We're on the verge of being safe to come out that sticking with the Wizard of Oz, there is a yellow brick road. We're just not quite sure that we have the map for the yellow brick road. Correct. That's yes. pretty good. Yeah. On balance. I yeah. mean, there's there's a lot of reason for a lot of optimism in that mix and a lot of reason for really trying to pay close attention to the nuances of the map and try to figure out where the yellow brick road really does take us. Yes, but, but I am yeah, so I'm I I am as I said, even without uh, this recent stimulus bill. Mm -hmm. I am very, very bullish on uh, the U.S. economy. And that is for, again, the same two to three year period, and then we'll see. Yes. Got it. So I would like to turn the page a little bit, if that's okay, and pick three items out of your uh, clustered resume and point out that you have served as the lay head of UJ Federation. You have served as the lay head of, or as the chair of the Conference of Presidents of uh, Major American Jewish Organizations. I always appreciate the word major in that title. I just want to make sure that you don't, there's any, nobody minor snuck in. It's no, just- it's, 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 Ezra, it's funny you say that because I will jokingly say the name really should be the Conference of Presidents of a few major and many minor <laughs> Jewish American I didn't know that. There you go. Jimmy, we've been spending too much time with each other. What can I tell you? Um, and you spent, I think, close to a decade as uh, the lay head of the Jewish agency. Or at least three years. That was it? Yes. Okay. So obviously service to, to the Jewish people, service to Jewish causes, service to the Jewish present and future is something you're willing to dedicate enormous amount of hours to, and in all, in all likelihood, enormous amounts of money to. But focusing on the hours for the moment, what, what kind of inspired you to do all that, to do all three of those? And um, did you see it sort of as, as a natural culmination of your upbringing, or was it a bit of a departure? And since I don't wanna to ask too many questions at one time, and tax your memory. I think I'll stop there and see what some of the answers are. So it was, uh, it was definitely, it came from our dinner table as a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother and father 
were also known as the Tish Tish. Yes, exactly. Okay. My my mother my mother and father um, were active uh, in UJA and also in the Federation of Jewish Philanthropies, uh, and we heard about it all the time at the dinner table. Not that mm -hmm. they were talking to us about it as much as they were talking to each other, and we sort of picked up on the language. So. Um, Without us being lectured to, it became abundantly obvious that this was what you were supposed to do. This is, this is a part of your life along with your day job. So at a relatively young age, when I was in my 20s, I went on the board of uh, a social services agency called FEGS, um, as we say, of blessed memory. Uh, and I became the chairman of FEGS in my 30s, and then in the four, it, it, after I was done with that, uh, they asked me uh, first to chair the uh, campaign for mm -hmm. UJA Federation, and then become the uh, the president, and then I went on to. Uh, the national UJA uh, organization and ran that. And from that, I took on the responsibility of uh, the Conference of Presidents, which was the smallest organization of all of those, but in many ways was also the most interesting uh, because I worked closely with Malcolm Honeline, who is a true dynamo and um, it was just, uh, it, it dealt with issues of Israel, United States, uh, and international politics. So it was, it was very, very interesting. It was also much, much easier to do the job when I did it, which was in about uh, 05, than it is today because back then, American Jews generally agreed on issues relating to Israel. Today, there is not that type of consensus like there was um, uh, 15 and 18 years ago. Um, I finished, I finished um, at the Conference of Presidents and I went like this with my hands. And I've said, I said to myself, I, <laughs> I, 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 I like the expression, I declared victory and retreated. And uh, I right. figured- A, a little version of been there, got there, been there, done it, got the t-shirt and you're willing to move on, right? That's right. And, and right. Um, I figured I was done with leadership positions in Jewish charities. I had served my time and onward and upward. And like two or three years after I was done at the Conference of Presidents, I got this call from Natan Sharansky. And Natan asked me if I would consider chairing the Jewish Agency. So I, I desperately wanted to say no, but there was this force out there that I couldn't quite identify that was pulling me in. So I said, I said to Nathan, let me think about it, knowing full well that I was going to do the job. And like four days later, I relented. If I may, let me, let me uh, recount one story that to me um, explains why I just couldn't say no to Natan and why I think others can't say no to him. So we were, we were at a uh, Jewish agency board meeting. Um, it's done with a podium and a dais and everybody sitting around um, in, a, in a big room. There are a hundred people there. And I was talking and uh, I was done talking and I had to introduce Natan. So I reached up 
grabbing the microphone on a boom and went like this to lower it because Natan, if he's 5'3", it's a lot. And just to, to tease him about his height, mm -hmm. Natan got up to the podium and he looked at me and he said to me in his, with his Russian accent, he said, you know, Jim, in the Soviet Union, in the Soviet prisons, it was a big benefit to be small. And then he went on with his talk. Later on that afternoon, we were driving over to the Knesset and I looked at Natan. I said, Natan, why was it such a benefit to be small in a Soviet prison? He said, two reasons. He said, when you were in the punishment cell, he said, they only had one size shirt and it was cold in the punishment cell. So if you were small, he said, you could take your hands and put them in the sleeves and you could uh, blow air into, your, into the shirt in your chest and you could keep yourself warm. And he said, the other reason was because they gave everybody the same number of calories uh, if, you, if you were in the punishment cell. So to the extent that you were smaller, you could, you could survive better on those calories than if you were big. I looked at him, I was incredulous by this whole thing. And I, I said, I asked him the obvious question. I said, Natan, you're a smart man. If the punishment cell was so bad, why didn't you just behave? And he looked at me and he said, because if I behaved, they would have won. And to me, that, that says it all about Natan Sharansky and the type of person that he is and, and who he is and what he is. Thanks for sharing. Sorry. So Jimmy, if you look at these years of devoted service, have they shaped your either uh, sense of confidence about a Jewish future, apprehensions about it, Jewish identity questions? When your parents sat at the table decades ago and did you the great uh, educational uh, favor of simply letting you listen to their conversations, it's entirely possible that they took the notion of continued Jewish identity for granted, just given where assimilation was in those decades. As you raised your children and as your children today sit around their table and, and raise their children, do you have concerns that perhaps um, have been affected by your years of service? And have you worked out possible solutions to these concerns? I'm just curious, what's your, what's your thinking on the subject? So I, I, haven't, I haven't worked out a solution. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know there's a lot of leakage from the tank in terms of people who are born Jewish, uh, but uh, may not may die not thinking they're really Jewish. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I do think that uh, the combination of Israel and uh, the combination of the ultra orthodox uh, are both very positive for Jewish life. Um, Israel, Israel, because it is the Jewish homeland, uh, and Jews will always have a home there. And I think as long as Israel is there, uh, it will be a Jewish state. Uh, the ultra Orthodox, because uh, they are growing exponentially faster than. Uh, we non-Orthodox Jews. And so um, there's just, they're, they're the reason that uh, Jewish population isn't declining. My guess is it's growing. And uh, 
My guess also is that uh, the reform and the conservative are going to pick up some of the gleanings from people that leave the uh, ultra orthodox ways, but still want to, in one way or another, live a Jewish life. And do you think that that has immediate impact, let's say on your children and your grandchildren in terms of their Jewish identities? No, I think they've got their Jewish identities. Uh, well, first of all, my kids are 36, 39, and 40. Right. And um, so their, their Jewish identities were, were formed uh, sure. basically 35 years ago, uh, in many ways by my wife, Meryl, uh, a, Ramaz, a Ramaz graduate. Um, who is a very, very positive Jew. I like to consider myself also a positive Jew, but I think Merrill had uh, a much greater effect on the kids' um, uh, Jewish sure. feeling. Right. Uh, right. And I think, um, I think that uh, at least with my, my family, knock on wood, uh, were I, I think my my kids are positively Jewish, and I think they're going to raise their kids uh, being positively Jewish. So, as we say, so far so good. All right, Jacob, did you want to ask something? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, Jimmy, you talked about the continuity and orthodox. So, uh, you know, uh, people are aware of your involvement with Art Scroll. Um, we have a daily Dafyomi. And uh, we, you know we live off those gemaras, and I was curious, um, you know, what what got you involved with Art Scroll, and if you uh, feel good about your impact that you had on the world through Art Scroll. Um, you know, um, the way I got involved goes back to about 1978. My father decided. Uh, that it might be interesting to learn some Talmud. So uh, we found this guy, Nassan Sherman, uh, to come and teach us. And uh, as I call him, Rabbi Sherman, uh, wears a long coat, wears a hat. And uh, we studied uh, Baba Metzia. Wow. Uh, but we also studied uh, the ultra-Orthodox world. And we did that for three or four years and uh, learned an enormous amount. And uh, I've, always, I've stayed friendly with Rabbi Sherman uh, for these uh, 40 plus years. And so when they started the uh, Masora Heritage Foundation. I went on the board. I talked to him regularly. Uh, we have lunch at the Glot Kosher restaurant uh, two or three times a year. And we enjoy each other's uh, company. And uh, we just, we're family. So it's a, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Thanks for sharing that. That's really beautiful. So, so, so again, just you, you, you and your father wanted to study Talmud and you somehow you were looking for an Orthodox rabbi and somehow you found Rabbi Sherman. Somebody, somebody in, in Denver recommended him. Okay. Okay. Beautiful. And that was it. We were off to the races. Okay. And then once you started learning, you got involved with what he was doing and, uh, yes. and it took a world of its own. How did, how did your dad and how did you take to the, to Baba Metzia? Uh, it was, it, like I said, it was, it was half the time. Rabbi, Rabbi Sherman wanted to, to talk about <laughs> Baba Metzia and right. we, we were just so interested in the social dynamic of his community that, mm -hmm. uh, about half of the hour was, was focused on learning and understanding what was going on in the community. And the other half was Baba Metzia. Got it. Interesting. I, I, did not, I did not become a Talmudic scholar 
from, from those lessons, uh, but I certainly got a much better understanding of, of uh, the ultra-Orthodox community. It's nice to know that not only did you at some point get interested in Middle Earth, you got interested in Middle March and you got interested in Baba Metsia. <laughs> and we're all covered. Yes. Um, I was going to turn the page again, Jacob. You, did you still have something on this or? Uh, go ahead, Ezra, please. So you've been involved in a family business for the same 45 plus years that you've been blowing the chauffeur and that you have been uh, first introduced to Bava Metsia. Um, family businesses have dynamics of their own. Um, whenever, I, I don't really read that much about the, uh, about the royal family, but whenever they fer refer to themselves as the firm, I sometimes think of conversations you and I have had over the years about the family. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, as the as interpersonal and psychological complexities characterize family businesses, um, to some extent, uh, what your experience has been, which is different than most, because some of those things have taken place in the context of a publicly traded company. And just curious how you how you look back. Do you ever wonder what would have happened if you had gone a different path, where it might have led you, if you hadn't gone into the into the family firm? and what thoughts you may have for, I suspect rather a number of people on the, either Zooming in or calling in who are involved in family businesses. So I never, I, I, I knew from a very young age, I was gonna work um, at, at Lowe's. Uh, mm -hmm. I, my father was in the hotel business um, in Atlantic City and then uh, built the Americana Hotel in Bell Harbor, Florida. Uh, by 58, 59, uh, 1958, 1959, he was bored. And um, uh, Nate Cummings said to my father, hey, Larry, why don't you look at this company, Lowe's Theaters? It just got split off from MGM in an antitrust decree and uh, those movie theaters might be a good site for hotels. So uh, to make a long story very short, uh, my father and uncle bought a 30% interest in Lowe's theaters. And in 1960, my father became the uh, CEO of the company and he quickly built a hotel on Lexington Avenue called The Summit. Um, which uh, just a funny story about it. When it when it was, my father only knew one hotel architect, who was Morris Lapidus, who had designed all the hotels down in Florida. So he hired Morris Lapidus to build, to to design the summit. And uh, when it was completed in 1961, all the reviewers said it's too far from the beach. And, <laughs> And it, it is truly uh, an ugly hotel and doesn't belong there, but, uh, but there it is. So I always knew that I was going to work in the company. When we, mm -hmm. when we would go on vacation to uh, the Americana in Florida, instead of sitting out in the sun and playing on the beach, I would go back in the bakery and bake or badger one of the bellboys and walk around with him. So I just knew I was right. going to That's be the world you know. That's, that's the world I knew. So I never think about what if, what if I had gone somewhere else. In terms of the business itself, um, I say all the time, uh, on the one hand, it is a family business. The family owns about a third of the company, but that means two thirds of the business is owned by the public. And... Uh, we work very hard to uh, not make it a family business, but rather to be working for the public shareholders. Um, the good thing about um, this family business is that because it's public and because uh, each family member that owns shares owns them free and clear, so they're not we're not connected at the hip financially with a non-public company because it's public. 
anybody who wants to sell their shares, they're free to do it. I don't know. I don't know what they do with their shares. I don't know how many shares anybody has. I just got an accounting at the end of the year uh, that tells me the total number of shares that the family controls. Uh, it was 30% back then, and it's about 33% now. So the family has been seemingly happy shareholders. And I think the fact that everyone uh, can make their own decision uh, goes a long way to maintaining family peace uh, I would think in, so. in, a, in, a, in a family business. So, Jimmy, if you if you sort of knew that Lowe's was or Lowe's theaters in those days, at least I, I remember you're being very, very pleased. This is a complete side thing. I, I happen to have spoken to you either the day or the day after you got the ticker symbol L for the company yes. instead of LTR, which was when? If you had to remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Um, I think I know it, when it was, actually. It was uh, 2010. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's about 11 or 12 years ago. Because I don't really I, remember this. You were, you were absolutely delighted. Well, it, it was, you know, it, it was sort of it was sort of like landing a uh, hundred pound fish with two pound test. I, re <laughs> I wrote I, I wrote a letter to Duncan Niederauer, mm -hmm. who, who was the CEO of of uh, the New York Stock Exchange. I had noticed that the symbol L was free. I guess it had been uh, Lockheed was the last company that had it. I noticed it was free, and mm -hmm. I wrote a letter. I wrote a letter to Duncan saying that um, Lowe's is about to celebrate its fiftieth anniversary, and wouldn't it be nice if, in commemoration of our fiftieth <laughs> anniversary, we got this ticker symbol L. Perfect. Roman numeral for 50. Perfect. Right. And, and in fact, he said, you got it, dude. And I remember kidding you that you were going to have to change the ticker symbol every year and adjust <laughs> the Roman numerals. <laughs> and you're going to have to reapply every year, you know, a little bit like the Super Bowl. <laughs> so, so you've been, you've been doing, so you've, you've known you've been going to Lowe's, let's say at least LX years ago, right? Mm-hmm. You didn't necessarily know you were going to run Lowe's, Alex, years ago when you were bothering the, you know, the pastry chefs and the uh, Morris the, the Baker and Bernie the bellhop. There you go. Um, as you look forward, is it? Would you like it to stay a family-run business, or do you have some sense of who those candidates might be, and are there family pressures that come up because you've got to resolve family dynamics within a public company? So um, family dynamics have been, knock on wood, uh, much easier than you might think. Um, and it's because my brother, my cousin, uh, whom I've been partners with now you know, in, in the leadership have all been phenomenal partners. Uh, there are, again, knock on wood, no fights. Uh, we, we manage by consensus. Uh, everybody, we know each other's strengths and weaknesses. Uh, we all seemingly get along uh, and we all make it work. And so um, it's, been, it's been a uh, just um, an atypical, ride for what you think of in terms of the typical family business. Right. There are uh, two from the next generation uh, that have been working at the company now for more than 10 years each. Uh, my son, Ben, and my nephew, Alex. And uh, again, as we say, so far, so good. In terms of the leadership of the company, uh, that's up to the board of directors. Uh, and far, right. be it from, far be it from me to... Right. Uh, I understand. Yeah. I wasn't pressing on that, and it's I not understand. that I just traded with. Jacob, you got anything on this? So uh, 
Jimmy, just add, so so just to repeat, so you're you're bullish on the future, uh, the hotel industry. I'm sure it's been a, a rough year in the business. It hasn't been a rough year. It's been a disastrous <laughs> year. Okay. It's but, horrendous. I think Jimmy would settle for rough, right? <laughs> oh my God, it's 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 been terrible. Uh, look, uh, uh, fifty one weeks ago. Uh, basically, all of our hotels were closed. Um, we've opened up ninety uh, percent of them uh, now, and uh, they're open generally not because they're making money, but rather because they're losing less money. So the industry still has a long way to go before it becomes profitable. Fortunately for Lowe's, we're not just a hotel company. Uh, we have a natural gas pipeline system. We have an insurance, property casualty insurance company. We have uh, a plastics manufacturing company. And we have a lot of cash that uh, we always carry around for rainy days like we had uh, in the past year. But, but the next two, three years, uh, you know, you're bullish. People are going to go back to hotels and uh, that part of it you're optimistic on. Yes, I, th I think uh, we'll, we'll see a significant improvement. It may take uh, one, two or three years to get back to the level of profitability that we were at um, in 2019. My guess is that the um, personal uh, um, resort traveler will come back very quickly. I think business travel uh, will come back much more slowly uh, due to the reticence of, of uh, corporations to send people on the road combined combined with uh, the fact that Zoom has become so ubiquitous that for a lot of people they'll say, why, why travel to a hotel with all the expense of the airfare and all the time, when if all it is is a one hour meeting, I can do it on a Zoom call. So I think it will take business travel a lot longer to come back than, um, than uh, the individual traveler. But I also think that the group business, uh, which will take uh, another six months or a year to begin to come back, will come back with a vengeance because I think work, uh, labor forces will be dispersed. Companies will try to create situations where they can bring their people together and to do that they will need to do uh, group meetings and, and the like. So I think there are some good trends or some uh, bad trends, but I think overall, over the fullness of time, it will work out. Are you concerned about inflation? People are starting to talk about inflation. Does that concern you overall? Very much so. Look, we've had, um, I, I, I was, um, I started in the uh, investment business at Lowe's uh, in 1977, and we were trading government bonds uh, starting in 79, 80, and 81 when short-term interest rates got to 20% and long-term interest rates uh, peaked at over 15%. And so since 1981, so for 40 years, we've had a bull market in bonds and interest rates. And um, I think, you know, I, I, I sort of feel like uh, uh, the boy who cried wolf, uh, but I think that this time uh, there really is a good chance that we're gonna see uh, some real inflation. We've been at about 2% inflation now for probably more than 20 years, 2% or less. Um, but I think that this uh, coming boom, uh, I think uh, with the um, 
with a stimulus package that I, I think is probably three or four times more than was needed with the uh, deficit spending in the past uh, this year and last year will have a, a government deficit of 15% of GDP. 15% of GDP is an enormous deficit. Sure. And um, I think all of that, I think those are flashing signs that uh, they're warning signs. They should be warning signs to the policymakers. I don't think they're taking it as that. Uh, instead, they're going big. But I think that big is uh, going to be something that we're going to be paying for as we uh, unleash very significant inflationary pressures. So, so one other point I wanted to follow up on Ezra's question about Jewish continuity. So, so you were saying, correct me if I'm wrong, do you feel like the Orthodox have a, a path of Jewish continuity? Is that what I heard you say or did I mis, misheard you? Uh, I think I was referring to the ultra-Orthodox. Okay. Uh, but I, I, uh, and I, I haven't studied the Orthodox community as closely, but my guess is there's uh, significant leakage uh, from the Orthodox community. The ultra-Orthodox community uh, tends to, to um, be much more insular um, and it's, it's uh, more difficult for young people, I think, to break out of that community. Uh, so, and then as you go down uh, with the conservatives and reform, uh, again, it's, there's, there's a lot of leakage out of that pot. So, so has that changed your Jewish philanthropic giving or has that, that fact, has that, has that had an effect on your family or, or your philanthropic giving, meaning, the, the leakage other places, how, how have you, um, you, you know, it's just a fact or? I, I, I just say that as a fact, um, I'm still a, uh, a committed Jew. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Zionist for other Jews. Uh, I'm, I'm not looking to make Aliyah to Israel. I like, I like going there once or twice a year. I don't want to live there. Uh, but uh, I I uh, I love I love the country, Israel. Um, but again, my my home is here in the United States. Okay, great. I'm gonna invite uh, Ezra. Did you have some follow up, or should we invite? Well, we asked Jimmy for an hour, and we got it. And um, we couldn't couldn't have gotten uh, Jimmy, you know, any more candid than he's been. I'm not sure the rabbi wants to add something, ask something or not, um, if you do Rabbi Babbage, this would be the, this would be the time. Yeah, sure. So uh, first I want to thank you, Jimmy, for the time this evening and thank you and your family for everything that you uh, do and have done for the Jewish community in New York City and, and the world at large. And there was one thing I was curious about and uh, also an observation, which I thought was important to um, reiterate, which you yourself mentioned. Now, being that the, uh, the hotel is so close to the synagogue, you know, we walk by frequently and we have noticed that uh, throughout the years, there are many, many Israeli dignitaries and, and politicians that stay at the hotel. They, sometimes we have the privilege, they join us for services on Shabbat, on Shabbos. So is that, a, you know, how did that develop? Is there some type of official partnership you have or, you know, exactly why is it, you know, that uh, these politicians stay there? I think uh, Netanyahu himself stayed there a few years ago, not too long back. So if you could kind of uh, enlighten us in that. I, you know, I can't, I can't really say other than they call 1-800-Lowe's-Hotels to make their reservations. Um, when, when I see Israeli politicians, I do not say to them, please come stay at the Regency. Um, it's, just, it's just been a hotel that for whatever reasons they, they've gravitated to. Maybe, it's, be, maybe bed... it's because your synagogue is so close to it. <laughs> and uh, the other We'd thing like I wanted, to think uh, so. yeah, the other thing I wanted to mention to highlight, which you yourself mentioned that your parents conducted, 
is that you know we all know that uh, charity and and uh, committing oneself to the, the the betterment of the lives of others is a very central Jewish value. The Torah tells us that uh, Abraham, Abraham, when he was assisting the guests, he got his son involved in the uh, the work as opposed to just asking the the help to do it. He asked his son to do it, primarily to train the son that uh, that the importance of giving. And you did mention that your family, your parents, um, they were not shy to to discuss openly the work they were involved in. And you said that that had a great impact on you and the other children. And I think one of the mistakes sometimes parents make when they're involved in so many good causes is that they don't um, make a proactive effort to involve their children in the process or even inform their children of what's taking place. I've been at the funerals and I've discovered sometimes the children don't even know their projects that the parents have been working on their entire lives. And uh, you mentioned that this is a great impact it has upon you. And I assume you do the same with your children. And I think it's a very important insight that the parents, when they are involved in, in worthy causes, that they shouldn't uh, keep it behind lock and key and they should make sure that family knows about it and, and even better have the family involved in, in the early stages. Because you know, your multi-generational commitment to charity seems to have originated primarily because your parents had the foresight to do such a thing like that. I totally agree. As I like to say, I'm in violent agreement. <laughs> Okay, thank you all. Thank you once again uh, for your time. Um, thank you, Ezra and Jacob, uh, for moderating, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, Pesach is coming up, and there's a lot to work on. If you have any chametz forms or uh, need shmurah matzah, anything that you need, please reach out to uh, the, the synagogue office. And we wish everyone a wonderful uh, week, a happy and healthy week. Thank you. Good thank night. you. Good thank night. you, everybody. Good night, night, Jimmy. Thank you. Go on. Good night, Ezra.